to to talk about uh, to talk in this seminar. Um, so, in case there are any questions, feel feel free to interrupt me during the talk or or just afterwards. I uh, either way is fine for me. Um, and what I also should say, so everything I present here is joint work with uh, Joseph Dick from UNSW Sydney. I somehow forgot to put his name here on the title slide, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, but his name will appear in the theorems. Um, okay, uh, let me start with uh, with a short introduction. Um, so that sort of the motivation for what I'm, I'm presenting today. Um, so, so the, the, the quasi Monte Carlo theory and, and the method has now existed for almost uh, more than, than 100 years, starting with those uh, works by Weil and, and Coxman and Lafka. And initially it was just developed to, to, in, uh, to solve high dimensional integrals or to compute high dimensional integrals. Uh, but, but in the recent years, it was heavily used to to deal with um, with problems in uncertainty quantification, like like this problem you can see here, you know, the, the the famous this this standard problem everybody is dealing with, right? With a, a random Poisson a random Poisson problem with random diffusion coefficient, and and if you want to calculate some stochastic quantities of the solution. Then quasi Monte Carlo is is a, an extremely effective method to do that. Um, here are just a few uh, a few um, works which which sort of developed the theory for for parametric PDEs. Um, and and the whole thing also works with higher order quasi Monte Carlo points. So, so, the, so the 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 progression progression was somehow in, in the beginning you could only use Monte Carlo, uh, get rate one over square root of n. Then there was this breakthrough with quasi Monte Carlo, um, increasing the rate to almost one over n, uh, and then with higher order quasi Monte Carlo points uh, we can get up to at least uh, uh, essentially arbitrary order. Um, of course, there are other ways to do that, for example, sparse grids or a polynomial chaos and those sorts of things. Uh, but but in, if, when it comes to really high dimensional application, quasi Monte Carlo seems to have a slight edge on the, on the other methods. And, and, and so, so this worked really well for, for those uh, parametric PDE equations. Um, and and now the, the, the new tool or one of the new tools seems to be um, machine learning, especially neural networks. Um, and, and I'm sure all of you know what those are. I'm, I'm, I'm just, yeah, here, here's the, the most simple form, a feed forward net network. Um, and here are a few of those milestones in the recent years, starting, I guess, with, with AlexNet, which was the first competitive uh, image rec recognition software. And, and in the recent years, um, the, the the rise of transformer networks for speech recognition and for text uh, text generation and stuff like that. Um, so, so in all those applications, neural networks have been extremely successful. There are also some. There are also there's also a lot of work trying to use neural networks to solve numerical analysis problems. Uh, also, there has been some success. But all this success um, comes at high, high cost. For example, AlexNet here, um, if you look in the original paper, you find out that they, they trained it over 90 epochs with more than 1 million images, uh, which of course is really expensive. Um, a recent work by a colleague of, of mine in Vienna, uh, Philip Coase, uh, they used neural networks to, to solve or to find small eigenvalues of the electronic Schrodinger equation, uh, which which is fundamental in in, in computational chemistry, um, and they 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 needed almost a hundred thousand epochs for for training, uh, and also in other examples, what you see, for example, the weak generative adversarial networks, which have become quite pop popular recently for solving PDEs. Um, in, in their in the original paper, they used twenty thousand epochs 
uh, for an error of, of just 1%. So it's it's really expensive to do those. And, and, and at the moment, it turns out only to be useful in really high dimensional settings. So it seems that, that there is a need for, for more efficient training methods. And this is exactly what we're trying to do here. And, and the hope is that quasi Monte Carlo methods can repeat their success from, from PDEs in, in neural networks. So we kind of were inspired by the success of quasi Monte Carlo methods for, for random PDEs and try to use it here again. Um, so so any, any training of a neural network is, is essentially a data fitting, right? You have some data X and some responses Y, and we want to find a predictor F, which, uh, which maps our, our data space to the response space, and, and we want to find good approximations. And of course, the simplest example would be a linear regression, right, like that. Um, but another example, of course, could be that F, F is a neural network and W are the, the network parameters. So this is sort of the goal. It, it doesn't really matter that our, our responses are one dimensional. This can be generalized to, to arbitrary dimensions. It's just, uh, it just makes everything easier. Okay, um, yeah, here's this picture of the linear regression. I mean, this is kind of the goal, right? Um, so the question is now how to measure the quality of the predictor and inspired by the by the least squares method um we we use this least squares uh, loss functional here right here you have the predictions here you have the 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 targets if you wish um and and often you want to have some regularization here uh, which we denote by r um uh, which which is already necessary, for example, if you want to do lasso regression, which is least squares with an L1 constraint. Um, but as soon as you go to gradient descent or something like that, you want somehow to, to keep your, your weights in check uh, to, to, to penalize, if you want, if you wish, to penalize exploding weights. Um, that's the idea. And um, so, so this is the general form of the loss function that we assume at the moment, um, or, or for this talk. Um, okay, and of course we can expand this. And the point of expanding this is you see only the red parts depend on the weight or on the predictor itself, right? This is just dependent on the data. Um, and also the, the regularization term depends on the data, but we, we, we are not considering the regularization term for what comes now, uh, just to make it easier. So we are interested only in those two terms because they change with uh, if we change the weights. And of course, this is the expensive part if, you, if we use an iterative method, right? Uh, because uh, as soon as this gets a little bit more complicated, we cannot, we have to use iterative methods to optimize uh, this loss function. And, and this means we need to recompute those two red terms in each iteration, while we can just pre-compute this term and it stays the same. Um, there, another question is how to do this um, effectively. So in general, what you will need to do if you use gradient descent, you will need to comp compute gradients of this form, right? And usually n, the number of data points is large. And there are a couple of techniques which can be used to reduce uh, the computational complexity. And, and one of the simplest one is, is, is called patch gradient descent. Uh, instead of computing the full sum here, you just choose a random sample, sample of m terms of the sum and m is small and then you use that as an approximation to uh, the full sum. Some more advanced techniques would, would include for example support points where, where one tries to, to approximate the distribution of the xn by, by a few points which are then called the support points. Uh, and, and then you can show that, that optimizing on those support points also optimizes the, 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 the correct um, loss function. Um, and another method, uh, another class of methods would be uh, so-called sketching algorithms, 
uh, which also approximates the, the gradient in, in some sophisticated way. But all of those methods essentially are stuck with the convergence rate of Monte Carlo. Uh, that's the bottom line. So what's the idea? Well, we want to find an, a cheap approximation of the, of the real loss, right? This, this thing here. Um, and to do that, we need to approximate those two terms, right? Those are the two red terms from before, which change in every iteration step. Um, and what we're trying to do is to replace those long sums by short sums using quasi Monte Carlo. Um, yeah, you see those two sums are very similar. Uh, just, just here you, you multiply with the, with the targets and here it's just the, the predictor itself. Um, okay, and to do that, uh, we introduce a set of points in our data space right, a set of n point, m points. And then we try to calculate weights such that this short sum over the m points of the predictor um, approximates the long sum. And of course, those weights should only depend, um, should only depend on, on the point set itself, but not on the, on the predictor, not on the weights, because this means we pre-compute those weights once, and then uh, we just run the iteration. That's the idea. Um, and the same we do for the second sum, right? It will, it will turn out to be slightly different weights, but the, 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 the method is the same. And then instead of calculating this long sum or computing the gradient of this long sum, we can compute the gradient of the short sum. That's the idea. Um, and and, and what's the benefit of that? Well, this decouples the training, the, 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 the computational effort for training or for the optimization from the data. Um, because now, if we do this approximation, we can find almost optimal parameters for, for the neural network by just minimizing this approximate loss function here, right? Um, and, and computing the weights, which we need for the approximation, depends on the size of the data set and on the number of approximate points set M we choose. So it depends on N and M, but it does not depend on the weights. So it will be, it will stay the same in each step of the optimization. Um, in turn, finding the optimal weights now depends only on the size of this sum here and on the number of the optimization steps required, but it does not depend anymore on the number of data points n. Okay, so instead of first, num uh, the, the naive approach would, be, would cost us something like number of data points times number of optimization steps. And with this approximation, we can reduce this to number of data points plus number of optimization steps. And of course, uh, um, if we have a plus here, that's much cheaper than if we have a multiplication here. Um, okay, so how can we do that? Well, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, in the previous, okay, in this slide. So just uh, to make sure that uh, I'm not missing something. So N here is a number of your quasi Monte will be quasi Monte Carlo points, right? So uh, yeah, capital, capital M. M. This. Okay, so capital M and N, so N is related to, capital N is related to? Oh, N, capital N is the number of data points. Of the data points, okay. So here, do you don't have any assumption about the regularity of, of the, uh, I mean, your F, the predictor, and also your weight function, I mean, uh, so you work without any assumption about uh, on that? Okay, at the moment, I don't have any assumptions, but of course, we will need some, some assumptions on F. So okay, in fact, okay. we would need regularity on F, otherwise it's of course hopeless. Um, okay, but, thank you very much. Yeah. But, but, but what's important is we don't have any assumption on the data, which is somehow different to um, those methods I, I mentioned before, like support points, for example. There you need some assumptions on the distribution of the data and, and, and we don't have this. 
The only thing we need is, of course, that our data is contained in a unit cube or in some bounded domain, right? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I, I do have one question. Yes. Uh, here, here you're talking uh, about weights, both the weights of your neural network as calligraphical W, yeah. right? And the weights of your, if you're quasi Monte Carlo sampling here, the W XP yes. wetting, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so here you're saying uh, you, the idea is to find the weights, calligraphical weights of, of the model, uh, but instead of, of, of looping over the N data that could be large, you want to uh, use just M point yes. sample from quasi Monte Carlo. Exactly. Uh, but here you're saying that you compute the weights WXP, but uh, do you have a closed formula for this? You have to compute this, these weights beforehand or something yes. like that. Okay, you're completely right. The notation is suboptimal. Uh, so calligraphic W is, is not the same as, as this W. Um, but to answer your question, um, yes, we, we will have a closed formula for W, which will come in, in the next slides. Oh, okay, that's nice. And which can be compu computed efficiently. That's, that's sort of the point of, of this. So we can, we can efficiently compute those weights here uh, in a pre-computation step and then start any, any optimization such as gradient descent or whatever you want which just now then is used to find optimal weights calligraphic w okay okay this that's clear now thank you very much okay thanks thanks for the question um okay so and of, of course yeah we now we already said it we want to use quasi monte carlo points and we want to use a special kind of quasi monte carlo points called digital nets uh, it's a bit complicated to write down what a digital net is um but i i need the, the 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 terminology so so we say a set of points is a tms net in base b if we have b to the m points right so the number of points is b to the m and if each elementary interval of this form here contains the same number of points um and the same number is b to the t. So ideally, if, if you use base two, so if b is two, those are dyadic intervals. Right? I, I will have pictures on the next slide. And all those intervals are constructed such that their volume is exactly this b to the t minus m. And t and m is in the, in the definition. Um, and then you want your you choose you want to choose your points such that in each of those intervals is the corresponding share of of quasi monte carlo points which is b to the t so all of those intervals have the same size and you want that all of those intervals contain the same number of points that's essentially um the idea um okay here's a picture a two-dimensional picture this would be um a zero to two net um those those would be the points and now each of those intervals contain exactly one point and notice each interval has has volume one over four one quarter okay but not only these but also these contain exactly one point and there is a third kind of, of dyadic intervals in this setting, which would be those. And also those contain exactly one point. Okay. So we have partitions of a unit cube in each direction. So here we have three directions if you, if you want. So th this would be the first kind. This would be the second kind. And this would be the third kind of, of directions. So we have three different parti partitions in 2D in this case. Um, and yeah, a quick remark how to, how to construct those nets. Um, essentially what you have to do is you choose in a clever way generator matrix, matrices which, are, uh, which have enough linear independence in them in a certain way. 
And then what you do is uh, you define the ith coordinate of the mth digit net point by this formula where where just the, the, the digits of this expansion are calculated via the, those generator matrices uh, modulo the base. Um, and and uh, there, so this is nothing new. This exists since the 60s. Uh, and, and famous examples are, for example, the Sobel sequence, which can be, which is also implemented in MATLAB, for example, um, or neither write the sequences um, or um, T value optimized Sobel sequences, which are a bit more recent and will be important for, for our um, purposes. Um, one thing I should mention. I said, so, so this would be a net with T value zero because each region uh, contains B to the zero many points. So two to the zero, it's just one, right? And this means smaller T value is good. If you have larger T value, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's not such a high quality uh, digital net. That's, that's something important. And, and this is why T value optimizable sequences will play, play a role because we want sequences with low T value. Okay, so now we have those points here in black and we have in red the data points. And, and now heuristically, what, how should we choose, choose the points? Well, if we want to re represent our data with, uh, with those four black points, well, it makes sense to just take those partitions and choose the weights such that they represent the number of points in the interval, right? So here would be 16 points, here it would be six, here it would be just two, and here it would be eight. Um, so if we choose just use this partition, we should choose the weights like that, 16 over 32, 6 over 32, and so on. But of course, this is suboptimal because we have lots more partitions to use, right? We can use the, the uh, horizontal partitions and also the, the the block partitions. Um, so the question we should choose, uh, we should ask is how many data points can be reached from a given digital net point by any elementary interval of the correct volume. So let's choose this data point here. Um, this data point uh, uh, reaches six. No, sorry. This digital net point reaches six data points within this region, but we have more regions we also have this one and now we reach nine data points so um, seven additional and then we still have this which gives us another three additional data points right and this is sort of the weight we want to assign to this digital net point and if you do that in, a, in the correct way to discount for uh, so you don't want to count data points double you end up with this formula which looks super complicated, but actually it's quite simple. It, it's this well-known um, um, recombination formula from sparse grids, for example. Sometimes it's also called the, the inclusion-exclusion principle. So uh, this, this is a well-known formula, actually. Um, and, and you see here, here we have the elementary intervals, i. Here we have the data points, x, and we count how many data points are in this interval. This runs over all, uh, sorry, this runs over all the, the, per, the, the, the intervals of a given partition. And this sum runs over all the possible partitions. And then you have some correction factors to account for counting double and triple and so on. Um, and with those, those weights, uh, we can approximate this long sum here by this short sum. And of course, we have to assume that b to the m prime is much shorter, much smaller than n. And this is exactly what we wanted. Um, at, at the moment, I didn't see it say anything about this approximation quality. This will come later. Um, but this is kind of now what, what we do. Um, the question, of course, is, or the first question is how to compute this, right? And the main challenge is to compute the, 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 le the latter part here. So this, these are the complicated sums. Because this sum, this is only over the number of dimensions, right? So this will be linear in the number of dimensions. This is totally fine. The challenging part is this here, uh, or here again. So, um, and, and if 
if you do a rough estimate, how many terms do we have in the sum? You, you end up with something like that. So exponential in L and, uh, and here you have another exponential. So it's, it's infeasible or a direct compu computation is intractable. But and this is now why we use digital nets. Um, we have very nice properties with those dyadic intervals. Um, so where's the idea? Let's say we have a data point, uh, sorry, a data point here in red and the digital net point here in blue. And now we want to find out all the intervals which con contain the two. And we want to, to do that efficiently. So the first thing we do is we construct the smallest dyadic interval which contains bo both of them. This is an easy computation. And then we just compare this dyadic interval with all the others, with all the ones of the correct size uh, and check if it's included. And uh, this can be done in a very efficient way. Uh, and, and I would like to explain how this can be done. And here's the algorithm. So first, um, first we, we construct the smallest dyadic interval, which contains both points. And this is essentially uh, this line here. So here we have the data point, here we have the digital net point in the chth coordinate. Um, and then we, we search uh, the uh, we search the, the largest index ij such that this is satisfied for some a. This corresponds to finding the smallest interval, so finding this blue area here. Uh, this is an easy computation, and then we use that um, an elementary interval of the correct size contains both points exactly if it is um, given by the vector d of the correct size and all entries of the vector d are, are entry-wise smaller than the vector i, which is generated in the first step. Um, this, is, this is not hard to see. Um, if you write it down, it just means uh, that the elementary intervals form a partition. And if, if this is satisfied, so if the elementary interval is larger, then it will contain our interval we, find, we found here. Um, okay, so all we need to do is to compute this sum here um, and then sum of all data points. So now how do, you how do we compute this sum? Well, um, so this, this is what we need to do, right? Um, we have the numbers n and we need to compute them. And here we can use a very nice recursive formula, which is given here. Uh, and, and you see now it's, it's trivial because you just start with dimension one. In dimension one, it's easy. Uh, if S is one, the number, the, the, the number of, of Ds, which are equal to L and are smaller than a given I is trivial to compute. It's either one or zero. And then from, from dimension one, we use this recursion to go in linear time to any dimension S. Um, and, and this gives us the first theorem together with Joseph Dick in Sydney. Um, this algorithm has a startup cost of computing the weights. And this is linear in the dimension, log linear in the number of quasi Monte Carlo points and linear in the number of data points. This has to be once before the optimization. And then within the optimization, we have to recompute our approximate loss functional. Um, but this now costs only linear in the dimension and linear in the quasi number of quasi Monte Carlo points. And the number of data points does not appear anymore. So our optimization is really independent of the number of data points. Um, I'm sorry. One Hello. question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that till now you didn't spoke about um, hierarchy. So you, I know you as a hierarchical matrix guy and maybe some ideas. Do no. you see here some potential for hierarchy? Somehow everything till now is flat. Yes. Um, 
So at, at the moment, we don't have any, any hierarchical matrix stuff in there. No, I do not meet matrices, H matrices. I mean, uh, hierarchical ideas. So, so you have partitioning, I think. Uh, yes. Maybe to, he, to have hierarchy of partitioning, partitions. Um, I mean, may, the the problem with 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 no, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure if there's a problem, but the point is we we don't. Th there's no real need for it because it's it's optimal. So so the cost of the algorithm is optimal. I mean, it has to be linear in the number of of quasi Monte Carlo points, and it sort of has to be linear in the number of dimensions. So I, I don't think this can be approved by much. The, the only thing which probably could be improved is that we we are so we have here number of quasi Monte Carlo points times number of data points and of, obviously it would be nicer to have a plus here so maybe by using a, a, a hierarchical approach this could be improved um, but yeah I'm to be honest I'm, I'm not sorry sure. also in these details I already forgot the global idea I will search for better uh, quadrature points. Or what? Sorry? Are we searching for better quadrature points? So what we are doing now? What is the final goal? No, so so the final goal is to, to train to train a neural network, right? Okay. And to do that, we have to minimize a loss function. But this uh, computing the gradient of the loss function for stochastic gradient descent is, is expensive. Um, and so we, we try to compute uh, an approximation of the loss function, which is cheap to compute. And this is this M okay. here. Mm -hmm. And for, for that, we use quasi Monte Carlo points. Okay, see. And another question on previous pictures, you showed us some uh, previous, exactly. You show it 2D, but should we understand these pictures as D dimensional cubes? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is just a visualization, but but this also oh, everything works in in any dimension. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so this would be the algorithm for for arbitrary dimensions here, right? You you run over all dimension from one to s, and in each dimension you search the minimum distance between the data point and the quasi Monte Carlo point, and then you compute those numbers. Um, okay, so okay, the, the message is we can compute this approximate loss function in linear time in each iteration step and linear depending only on the number of quasi Monte Carlo points, not depending on the number of data points. Okay, so now the question is how good is this? So all, all, all this shows is we can compute something and it's cheap to compute it, but maybe maybe this this thing is, is crap. So uh, the second part of the talk should convince you that, that the approximation error is small. Uh, and to do that, this motivation I just gave with counting the points does not really help much. We have to come from a different direction. And this different direction involves uh, Walsh functions. So what are Walsh functions? Here, are the, here is the, the definition. And in, in one day, they look like that. So they are very similar to the Haar function basis. It's an L2 orthogonal basis, which can be defined in any dimension and they, they just attain the values zero and one if your basis is two. If your basis is not two, you can have different values. Um, but two, uh, two important properties. First, it's an L2 orthogonal basis and they are extremely well suited to approximate smooth functions, which is kind of, which is kind of surprising because they are anything else but smooth. Um, but but this this was somehow the result which enabled higher order quasi Monte Carlo points, and we were going to reuse that here. Okay, so let's go back to the goal. We want to approximate a sum of this form. Right? How can we do this? Well, first we can use a Walsh series expand approximation of f. So instead of f, we expand f in its Walsh coefficients. That's the same as a Fourier expansion, just with better basis functions. Um, and then we, we replace f by its approximation um, like that. Um, and then we want to replace this sum here by an integral. And to do that, 
we have to compute a data density function. So phi k is a data density, which is given explicitly by this formula. And it has the property that the integral over this is the same as this sum here. And now the idea is clear. Now we want to use quasi Monte Carlo to approximate this integral, integral right? So this is what we want to approximate. Now we can use quasi Monte Carlo to approximate the integral. Um, and but first we can we can replace the uh, the truncated expansion of f by the exact function because uh, those are L two orthogonal bases. So um, yeah, this is this is the same. Okay, so now we use a digital net to approximate this integral like this. Yeah. Um, and then we just have to choose a proper cut of K for the, for the approximation. And what we choose is we choose all Walsh functions with uh, a parameter alpha, a uh, parameter A, which satisfies this. And then if we do that, um, the cu curious thing is we end up with exactly the same weights as before. If we do that, this QMC approximation of this integral is gives you exactly the weights we had before when we just counted data points. And this now connects this approach with the previous approach and we can start analyzing errors. Uh, and if you look at that, we have, we have two errors, right? We have first this error coming from replacing F which is with its watch approximation. Um, and then we have another error which comes from replacing this integral by its QMC approximation. Okay, so here again, the first error, the second error. Um, and now we can use standard QMC theory to, to bound those errors. So it's well known that the Walsh series approximation error is bounded uh, linearly in the number of quasi Monte Carlo points. And the quadrature error for order alpha digital nets is uh, of order alpha. So this would be the number of quasi Monte Carlo points, B to the M. And here we have minus alpha here. There's some logarithmic factor, but we ignore this. Um, and there's another, uh, another problem. Here you see we have M minus M prime. And M prime was the order of the approximation of um, of, the, of the function f with Wolf, Walsh functions. So we need our digital nets to be more accurate than the approximation here. And in the end, you, need, you will need to balance those two factors, which will come in a second. Um, but but this, th those are the two approximations er er errors we need. Um, and this now already gives the main result. So to summarize, we have a new algorithm which is efficient to approximate large sums of that form. We call the approximation this, right, M. And if we choose our parameters optimally, we get almost linear convergence of the approximate loss function to the, to the exact loss function here. And the startup cost is linear in the number of data and the online cost is linear in the number of quasi Monte Carlo points. That's the important message. So we have an efficient algorithm which converges with almost order one to the exact uh, thing we want to compute. Um, okay, so there, there are a couple of, of remarks. First, if your data is already a QMC point set, then the approximate data density is just one, and then the error is of higher order. So here we only get up to close to order one if we choose alpha high enough. But if our original data already is the QMC point set, then we get arbitrarily high convergence. Uh, and sorry, what I should mention here, this is only true if F is sufficiently smooth, right? So if your neural network depends in a smooth way on the data, uh, which is, for example, given um, if, oh, sorry, no, no, yeah, that comes here. I will I'll talk about this in a second. So the first message is if 
your data is a QMC point set, you can get arbitrarily high order of conversions. This case has already been analyzed in a work with uh, of Christoph Schwab and, and co-workers, because this is the case which you often have when you try to solve partial differential equations with neural networks, then you kind of choose your data. You, you, can, you can choose your data arbitrarily, right? And you just choose them as a Q, QMC data set. And then you can, can get arbitrary high uh, convergence. And the second part is all error estimates depend on a certain norm of the neural network F. And this norm contains a lot of derivatives, right? Um, but the nice thing is this norm can be computed explicitly for feed forward networks at least. And if we use holomorphic activation functions, like for example, those examples here, then uh, the norm can be controlled in a very straightforward way by uh, a, a norm of the weights. So if we just uh, ensure that the weights are bounded in a certain way, then we will know that also this norm is bounded and the whole thing works. This is also done in this paper. Um, okay. So another, another question is how to find good digital nets because there are many digital nets available. And the most challenging part is to approximate this integral uh, in, in the proof. In the proof, that's the most challenging part. <laughs> and the problem is that uh, without going into too many details, we want to integrate a smooth function f times a function which is piecewise constant. And this means, uh, and it's piecewise constant uh, given by this parameter m prime here. So m prime sort of uh, tells you how many jumps this function has. And to do that effectively, we need a digital net, net of size m minus t larger than m prime and t is this quality parameter. And if this is not satisfied, then the approximation will be really bad. And, and here's the problem that there are some strict limits on the, on the t value of digital nets. So t grows almost linearly with that dimension. And this means at the moment uh, for high dimensional problems, it, it's kind of difficult to, to use this method. And to get around this, uh, we will hope in future work to use weighted spaces because exactly the same problem has been there in, in, in random PD problems. Um, the, in, in the 90s, the general wisdom was you cannot use QMC for more than 10 dimensions because then the T value will kill you and, and you have no chance in getting a good approximation. Uh, but then along came Ian Sloan and, and, and Greg Wojniakowski and they introduced weighted spaces and they managed to construct digital nets which work nicely in, in, in lots of dimensions, much, much higher than, than, um, than uh, 10 dimensions. And we hope that we can do something similarly um, for this application. And what do we need? Well, in the end, our data points are, for example, images, right? In, in image recognition, your data points would be images. So those would be um, just points in a very high dimensional space. And uh, what we want now is digital nets with um, T values, which depend sort of on a subset of the numbers of dimensions I'm looking at. Um, and, and this would then give us the chance to approximate this integral uh, in a dimension independent way. Um, but this uh, at the moment doesn't work um, and is still, um, yeah. There's some 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 work is needed on this front here. Um, yeah, here again, um, maybe that's a bit too specific now, but what we want is we we want to be able to we want to be able to to construct digital nets with the given distribution of t values when I add dimensions, and at the moment this is seems to be infeasible um, or, or it, it, there's, it's not clear how to do this, but there are some approaches which might render this task feasible. Um, okay. 
I think I'll just skip this. Um, a few numerical examples. So this is a very simple linear regression in just six dimensions. And here you see it works beautifully. Um, what you see here <laughs> is the difference between exact loss function and our approximate loss function. And this converges with the order of one, just as we predicted. And here's the computation cost. So um, if you have a lot of data, this already pays off. It's like if you have if you have more than thousand data points, this already pays off. But of course, linear regression is super simple. So we would like to use something more challenging. And here we 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 try to to compute this on this standard machine learning example. Or maybe and now it's not standard anymore. Uh, it's it's too, it's outdated already. But it's this uh, this collection of handwritten digits, MNIST. And what we did here is we we interpret interpreted these digits as data points in a hundred dimensional space. So we subsampled the images to have a hundred pixels. Um, and then uh, we try to compute uh, the approximate loss function. And what you see here is that um, the approximation error is acceptable. So this would be uh, the different colors represent different approximation qualities. And this color here, the, the purple color is the best approximation quality. And you see you have an approximation error on the order of, of 10% which of course is not great but it's um, um it's acceptable what we have to say is what i have to say is i did not train any network here i just used uh randomly generated networks and tried and 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 compared how good can i approximate the um, the loss function and this is for a shallow neural network and I did the same for a deep neural network. I think here I have six or seven layers and you see it doesn't change much. So it seems that this is quite robust in the number of layers. Um, and this is, yeah, and here you see the, the distribution of data. So this is from the handwritten digits example and you see this data is not uniformly distributed. So I, I, I randomly, I, I, I put, I, I selected some random dimensions um, and just plotted the data distribution and you see it's not at all uniformly distributed it's, uh, distributed uh, it's on the at the other at the opposite actually it's it's very singularly distributed and this doesn't really disturb the method too much okay and that's all i want to say thanks very much